Let me. The speaker view is going to make it easy for you to see the whole page. Um, so we had a, a friendship force trip to Birmingham back in 2016. And it's called the Magic City. And here is our group, some of our group. There are a few people missing. I'm not going to um, spend too much time on that. But it's called the Magic City. It had a big sign like this back in 1926. Welcome to Birmingham because they thought they were magic because they had iron ore, coal, and limestone right there. And that made them a really important place. As it turned out, they were right about that. So eventually that sign wore out, but this one was replaced by the uh, Rotary Club. So this was our host in Birmingham. And the reason I put it up particularly was all this forest in back of Vicki. In Dallas, we are Blackland Prairie, but here in Birmingham, we're in the deep Southern forest. And a lot of what we saw was forested and that was a nice change for us. So we started out the very first day going to Pepper Place Market and it's a place, uh, an actual market, but also, you know, kind of a fun place to go party in the evenings or go have lunch. So we, that was how we started out. And in addition to all the fruit and vegetables and flowers you can get, they did have all the craft items and things like that. There, maybe we can find an owl house there. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, in a few of our group, we had lunch. Um, the, one of the wonderful places, my favorite, in fact, was the Aldrich Gardens. This is Kay and Eddie Aldrich who owned this place and lived on it for quite a while. Uh, it's a 30 acre woodland garden and it features the hydrangeas, which you see in the background. And Eddie and his father were both horticulturists and they saw this property back in 1966 because they planted some trees there for the owner. And when it finally came up for sale 11 years later, they bought it. They, they had their eye on it all this time because they thought that it would make a wonderful public garden. And so with 30 acres, they planned, planned uh, to uh, have it be a public garden. And eventually the city of Hoover, which would be like Plano is to Dallas, a little suburb, the city of Hoover bought it in 1997. So this is the entrance to the Aldridge house and they lived here until it was uh, sold to the city. I'm gonna, it, this uh, does jump forward a little bit, let me go back. So on this uh, property, there's a five acre lake and all kinds of hiking trails. And um, it's, a, it's a beautiful property in addition to the azalea, the hydrangeas, I'm sorry, that, that it's especially noted for. What it's, what, um, Eddie and his father were interested in was the hydrangeas because the, the wonderful soil and climate of the Deep South is perfectly suited for it. And they, they found um, an, a hydrangea that was brought to them by a lady out in the woods and they ended up propagating it. This was the Cox family estate back in 1966. And some of the uh, hydrangeas that they have, they have over a hundred varieties there. So there's not just one, and we got a guided tour to see the hydrangeas. This is the um, snowflake hydrangea that they were famous for propagating. So this lady found this bush growing in the woods wild and dug up one and brought it to Eddie because he was a horticulturist and she knew him and said, look at this. this, this is something different. This is the way most hydrangeas look. They just have this single petal. But this one, you notice has this beautiful double petal. And so he took a cutting, in fact, he took two cuttings from this plant that she had dug up. And one of them died, you know, tried to be planted it, tried to propagate it, but the other one survived. And that is where all the snowflake hydrangeas have come from since then. This, is, this was grandma. So if you've ever seen any of these or bought them, this is where they started from that one plant. So this is a normal hydrangea, an oak leaf hydrangea. And here are some more of these snowflakes. They're really beautiful plants and long cone-shaped groups of flowerets. <clears throat> they patented the snowflake in 1971, but they never charged any royalties for it or did anything with it. They just wanted to share it with uh, people who loved hydrangeas like they did. So they're all different colors. The blue ones that you see, of course, are because they're in the South. 
and they have an acid soil. And I'm sure most of you who are gardeners knew that, that, that the acid soil will make a flower blue. But the alkaline soil, like we have in Dallas, we have pink ones. Now, if we want blue ones, we have to feed it some acid fertilizer. And you see something in the middle that are kind of a little bit of each, they probably put some fertilizer on. Definitely put fertilizer for the pink ones because, because that wouldn't be uh, native to Alabama. And this one I think is cute. It has these little cups on it. So after we had our little tour with our guide, we walked through the woods and saw some of the other things. They have a lot of sculptures in the garden. And of course, all kinds of other flowers. So we went for a little walk. <laughs> they have lots of other plants and bushes in addition to the hydrangeas, as you see. But they look like they're just growing wild everywhere. And it's, it's really a beautiful walk. So we're going to move on now, exit through the gift shop again. We have a garden shop there. To the Arlington Antebellum House. Now the, Ar the Arlington Antebellum House is sometimes called the Mud House. Uh, because it was built by um, William Mudd family. It's the only antebellum house in, in Birmingham. At that time, Birmingham, Birmingham was uh, farther away. It was in the little suburb of Elian. I'm not sure how to pronounce it, Eliton. Uh, but eventually Birmingham took it over and that little town disappeared altogether. But it was a former plantation house when it was out in the country and had, it still has six acres of landscape gardens but now it's actually pretty close to downtown Birmingham. And it serves as a museum for decorative arts, including uh, 19th century furniture and textiles and paintings. And it was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1970. So we had a nice little tour through that and you see some of the antiques that are in this house that are really lovely if you're into that kind of thing. Wouldn't you love to have chairs like that? They were just so pretty. all set for a, a dining area and the several bedrooms in the house with the uh, antique furniture that were fun. So Arlington is the only surviving structure from the time that Ellerton was a, t a little town. Hmm. An antique sewing machine. I've never seen one like that. I don't know about the rest of you. And in the kitchen, I didn't take a picture of the whole kitchen, but one of our people looking at the fireplace kitchen. In the evening, we had a little uh, field trip, I guess you could say, to the baseball field. Now, you have to know something about people from Alabama. They are big sports fans. If you didn't know that, you will find out by the time we get through with this. So we went out to the baseball game. It was um, the Barons versus Chattanooga. I can't tell you right now who won. <laughs> I guess maybe we didn't even stay till the end, but it was 50 cent hot dog night and that was a big thing. <laughs> Another garden we visited, and I'm, I'm a garden lover I, in, in the interest of self-disclosure. I am a garden lover per, uh, and love every one that we go to. So we did do a very brief visit to the botanical garden, uh, 67 acres because uh, they have about 25 separate little gardens in it. Uh, we visited the Japanese garden, which I thought was really lovely. And they have a lot of sculpture as well. About 30 outdoor sculptures. Here's one of them and a few of our people walking through them. One of the interesting things in Birmingham to visit is the Civil Rights District. And of course, we're probably all familiar with the 16th Street Baptist Church. Uh, the, the Civil Rights District includes the church and a museum and a park on three corners of, a, of an intersection. It was designated this uh, by executive order as a national monument by President Obama. This is the church organized in 1873. It was in several other buildings first. And of course, because of segregation, the churches and this church and other black churches in Birmingham ser served as a meeting place for a social center and lecture hall for a number of activities for the, the uh, black citizens. And a number of famous people spoke at this church, W.E.B. Dubois, Mary McLeod Bethune, Paul Robeson, Ralph Bunch were, were some of the notable blacks who spoke at this church. 
and served as a headquarters for the civil rights mass meetings and rallies in the early, early 60s. And this is the church here now across the street and this building to the left of it is the civil rights museum. And some of the headlines from that day of course were why this church became famous is because of the four little children who, four little girls who died uh, at their Sunday school in the, in the stairway at that church uh, when it uh, was bombed. So the Civil Rights Museum tells a lot about what happened in the 60s during the Civil Rights Movement. Um, I, I want to show you a little dedication that Martin Luther King said, I like to believe that the negative extremes of Birmingham's past will resolve into the positive and utopian extreme of our future that the sins of a dark yesterday will be redeemed in the achievement of a bright tomorrow. And of course, the fact that this, this, this um, institute is even in Birmingham shows um, uh, some uh, effort on the part of uh, Birmingham to um, pay attention to the civil rights movement, which is so much part of its past. You might notice in this old picture that hotels were separate uh, and um, even a lot of other things like drinking fountains, churches were all separate um, prior to 1950s and 60s and classrooms, of course. In fact, when I moved to Dallas, I taught in a segregated school in 1959. And Rosa Parks, of course, was uh, in Montgomery, which is not very far away. She was actually seated in the first row of the black section toward the back of the bus, but the bus filled up and she was asked to move and she would not. This boycott of the bus system in Birmingham lasted over a year. So it was something that was one of those turning points. Uh, in addition to Martin Luther King, who most of us are familiar with, uh, uh, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth was another one who uh, was, um, it survived a lot of hardships in the, the uh, times that were hard for blacks, but uh, continued in the civil rights movement along with Martin Luther King. Birmingham had, had such a bad reputation over uh, the 1950s and 60s, there were over 50 bombings. In fact, sometimes it was called Bombingham. It had a bad reputation. There were many marches, of course, that, that were done uh, and little videos would show on the wall. Um, Martin Luther King sh uh, shown here. And some of them beginning in uh, Birmingham and other places, sit-ins. And the museum includes a lot of things from this era, uh, timelines of what happened and uh, Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail. Um, if anyone's interested, I have all 19 pages of it. I could read it to you. <laughs> just, just, just asking. And they have a replica <laughs> of his jail cell. I did read it. It's, it's very interesting. It was in, in response to, it, it tells what it was. It was in response to a group of, of Alabama clergymen, um, more or less saying, you know, you just need to be patient. You just need to wait a little while. And he said, no, I don't think so. We waited long enough. So this is where the Freedom March came beginning in Jackson, uh, coming up through Selma as we know in the bridge and uh, our, the march to Washington. And there are several multimedia presentations in that museum showing the march and then uh, Martin Luther King's speech on that uh, day. There's also an oral history project as, as some, of the, um, some of the things the museum does there, or the, I should call it an institute actually. And some of these videos where you can actually hear the, the uh, voices of these speakers. As I said, across the street on the other corner, across from, from the uh, Institute and Kitty Corner from the church is Kelly Ingram Park. And uh, this is a park that has some sculptures and quite a few sculptures in it about the, the way that uh, blacks were treated. Often dogs were set upon them. Uh, this is a statue, a group of statues of the four little girls who were in the bombed church. And Martin Luther King down uh, farther down the walk. 
what you see here. In the downtown area, which was, just, say, very, very close to it, you could, uh, we, we just passed through or walked by a few of the, out, the outdoor of some of the buildings. They do have a, a sports hall of fame, one of the sports things that we saw, and they're doing some reconstruction of old neighborhoods, carrying out some of the old stuff. This was a, a rail yard and a, a a stop on their light rail. So they've redeveloped this part of the, the um, close to downtown area, made a park out of it. <clears throat> this is just one little one that I threw in because of the pretty wooded area and the, the uh, type of house it is. This the Jemison house. Uh, Jemison was a developer and uh, he took some of this beautiful wooded areas and made all kinds of um, country clubs and shopping centers and neighborhoods and all kinds of things in this area, this pretty wooded area. So another part of our sports tour was visiting the Crossplex Sports Complex. That's a nice hand uh, mouthful. It's a great facility for swimming and track competitions. This was our president of the Alabama, uh, the, the Birmingham club, looking down the hallway. Uh, the complex hosts events from high schools and colleges when they get together and have all kinds of uh, meets of various kinds. And it has facilities for track, for swimming, um, tennis, fencing, wrestling, baseball, basketball, other sports. And some of the uh, like these, they can move these out of the way and have a track meet in here and all kinds of things. And if you happen to live in Birmingham, you can also get like a, a club membership here, just like you can any um, a sports facility where you can uh, come and exercise and take advantage of the equipment that they have here. Something you might not have thought was an interesting place to visit is a, a cast iron furnace. <laughs> And this is the Sloss Furnace. As I said, that, that Birmingham was in a place where they had coal, they had uh, iron ore, and they had everything that was necessary for having a blast furnace. So this is the only one that's still standing. There were quite a few in the area. This is the only one that's been preserved and is the only blast furnace in the US to be preserved and restored for public use. It operated as, as a pig iron producing blast furnace from 1882 to 1971. And it became very um, a, a very usable place or very important place during World War II. So you see the, the city of Birmingham, the downtown area, and over here, the, some of the coal mines and the Sloss furnace, which was pig iron, and then Republic Steel that made things like airplanes and um, real, uh, real um, railroad cars and various other things. <clears throat> so all of it was close by. In their visitor center, <coughs> excuse me, in their visitor center, they have some nice pictures of the early days. <clears throat> As I say, it became very important during World War II, particularly. And the site serves as an interpretive museum and it has a lot of things about it. So James Sloss, his name is on it, and uh, I want to tell you a little bit about him. He was of Scots-Irish descent, born in Birmingham, and he, he ended up being one of the uh, wealthiest merchants and plantation owners in the state. <clears throat> he first got interested in railroading and, <clears throat> and uh, realized the need for uh, Southern rail lines, and um, he promoted a Southern rail line that, that went all the way to the coast. And along with that was um, um, hauling tonnage or iron ore, coal, other products, um, building, um, building trains, building rail, um, rails and various things along the way. <clears throat> so he had a friend who is also in this business and had some backing from uh, Henry de Bartleben and built the Sloss Furnace Company in 1880 and went up, uh, online at 1882. So in 1883, at the uh, Louisville Exposition at the St. Louis World's Fair, the company won a bronze medal for the best pig iron. Now you may wonder why is it called pig iron? Well, you might look at this part of the picture. I'm gonna show you that in some detail. So when they cast iron and cast, um, cast pig iron, this 
what bar across here was called a sow. Now, if you've ever seen a mother sow, all the little piglets hook onto it, right? So those were called pigs. And so these, this was called pig arm. I never knew that. <clears throat> And the facility produced 24,000 tons of higher quality iron during its first year in operation and got to be uh, a very, very uh, profitable company. <clears throat> so if you do pig iron, there's some uh, slag or waste material. So I'm gonna show you this picture first, first about the process of making slag and secondly about the people. So a flux was added that would bond to these impurities that could be drained off. And then the slag was sent to slag pits, which were uh, not on the property anymore. But there used to be a place where they did drag it to uh, a pit and watered it down so it was cooled. And then it was crushed and sized with a big, um, like a big hammer thing. And, and it was used for concrete and road construction. So even the slag, the waste from the iron was still used in various other things. So here's about the people who worked at, at Sloss. So six men operated each furnace. And the stove tender was always white. He was the man in charge. But under him were three laborers and, and two keepers. And they were always black. And it was unwritten tradition that you were not, if you were black, you weren't allowed in supervisory jobs. <laughs> and this was the case until the Civil Acts right. Uh, Act, uh, Civil Rights Act of 1965. <clears throat> so the furnace has a visitor center and thousands of students come through there to learn all about what the industry was like in Birmingham and serves as an interpretive museum and sometimes a concert and festival venue. Who would know that? And after closing, it became one of the first industrial sites to be preserved. And in Fort Worth, we preserved our stockyards, our cattle stockyards, and um, here it's their industry. So in 1903, the Commercial Club at Birmingham wanted a symbol for the city, and they, they cast this huge statue of Vulcan, who is the Roman god of fire and metalworking. You see him in comparison to the, the people here, a huge thing, 55-foot statue. And it was exhibited at the Louisiana Purchase Exhibition in St. Louis with the, the World Fair there. Well, the question became then, what do we do with it after the fair? And it won all kinds of prizes too. So they decided they would build a park to um, display the Vulcan statue. <clears throat> So they made the Iron Man, or they called it, um, the, the Roman god. Uh, here he is up on his perch. And here is the designs for the park. And they decided to keep most of the wooded area. It's up on top of the hill that they put it so he could look down on the people and some planted some nice trees along the parking lot area. And it's accessible by, by uh, elevator. You can go all the way to the top, which we did, or you can climb the stairs and have a nice view of the city. A little hazy that day as far as seeing the city, but there is a view and he has a nice butt, <laughs> right? So this is actually the view you get uh, when you're out of the haze a little bit. <clears throat> well, well, Mary, Yes, we did live it. Jack and I lived in Birmingham when we were first married. Yes. And one of the ongoing, I mean, we were there, what, maybe three years, four years. And one of the ongoing things was the churches were wanting to make pants for the Vulcan statue. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. It was an ongoing <laughs> thing. Oh, uh, yeah, that, that does not surprise me. <laughs> Okay, uh, we, we did have to see more of the Alabama sports. So we, we had, they had a choice of taking us to Montgomery or to Tuscaloosa. And uh, Vicky, Vicky, who was in charge says, how much interest does your group have in sports? And I said, like zero. <laughs> so they said, well, you got to know what Alabamans are like. So we are going to take you to all our sports things anyway. <laughs> so, and that, and that was basically the way that conversation went. So, so we, we, we drove down to Tuscaloosa and we had a tour of the University of Alabama Stadium, which is quite nice. Now you might see the, uh, the little um, places where they have 
put their coaches, statues of their coaches, uh, who have won wonderful prizes for the University of Alabama. And I took one of Coach Bear Bryant because he was also at a and <laughs> I was at Alabama. And we had our tour, a college student took us around. Uh, the, the stadium is used for other things, the way Texas Stadium is in, in Arlington, Texas. So you can have your party, or I think it was set up for some kind of event, uh, actually the day that we were there. <coughs> Quite a large stadium, 101,000. <clears> the Crimson Tide, we were not there for, in, for a football game, but we did get to see the press box and the fancy things that you can see and went out onto the field. <clears throat> but the best part, of course, they like to show off is when they were champions and who won all these medals and um, who went on to play in the NFL Lots of them. Who are the All-Americans? And how many scholarships they have for various sports at Alabama? 85 of them being for football players. <clears throat> and yes, they said it's almost like a religion. <laughs> <clears throat> a little guy who is not with our group, but in the uh, locker room. And this I, amused me too. Uh, a donor named whose last name was Fail donated money, and so the the visiting team gets a locker room called the Fail. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You, you saw it with your own eyes. There it is. <clears throat> so our last our last uh, event was uh, of the week was a lunch on the um, Warrior River at the Cypress Inn, which was a very nice venue for a little party. Again, we're in the deep woods and beautiful views and had a nice um, nice luncheon to end up our trip in Alabama. And that's the end of my little presentation. Well, that's wonderful. That and was, anyone I, have any questions? I hope that someday you have a chance to visit. There's lots to see there. Yes. Mary. Hey. I think Mary, you should... since, Mary since you um, love gardens, have you been to Gibbs Gardens near Jasper, Georgia yet? I've not. I have to put that on my list. <laughs> there are so many, they, but I have a lot of them. Yeah, they have the largest Japanese garden outside oh. Japan. Gibbs Garden near where? near where? It's near Jasper. It's Ball Ground, Georgia. Ball Ground, okay, Georgia. And it's called I do make Gibbs, to see them. Gibbs Gardens. Okay. It's, it's like 250 acres, landscaped uh, acres. And he bought it 35 or so years ago and started landscaping it and mm -hmm. opened it to the public about five mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. And in the spring, there are over 20 million daffodils that bloom on the hills. Mm -hmm in the garden. It's amazing. Oh, that's gorgeous. So if you're ever in North Georgia, make sure you put Gibbs Gardens on your list. Uh, I wrote it down. Um, Kathleen so, might, um, if you twist her arm, she might let me show my American Gardens presentation sometime. I, I've been all over the United States, including Hawaii. Uh, and some of my favorite gardens are in there. And of course, gardens all over the US are so different. Uh, from the southern gardens with the magnolias and the um, azaleas all the way to the desert garden in, in Tucson, Longwood, um, the course of Dallas Arboretum, Hawaiian garden, so forth. So that's a possibility yeah, if, there enough, if there are enough garden. there are enough garden. I think we need to let Kathleen say a little bit about the Alabama <laughs> Bone Size Society. Kathleen was a member of the Alabama Bone Size Society, which you did the Japanese sculpture trees. And it, it was truly one of the one of the great bonsai clubs in America. It's right there in Dublin. Yeah. 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 There are some at some other gardens too, of course. Right. Well, the um you showed a picture of the botanical gardens there in Birmingham and um Southern Living Magazine, when we were living there in the mid 80s, um, Southern Living headquarters was like very close to the. Yes, yes, I heard that. 
and they they I think they funded it. I mean, they they had big sections, and um, I think if they wanted to do a magazine shoot or something, they'd make the garden the way they wanted for the issue. Um, but I mean, it was really lovely, and we did show the opening for the Japanese the the red entryway and. Um, um, that's where I first learned about bonsai, and I, I really was very involved with it until children. And it was like either I could take care of my children or I could take care of my bonsai plants. Yeah. So, um, well, if it were up to me, we would have spent more time in the botanical garden, you know, no, rather than the sports things. But you know, you're, you're the guests of where you go, and that's what happens. So, right. But everything was interesting, even the sports. Uh -huh. I'm going to throw in a sports thing for Birmingham. Uh, when I was, when we were living there, up there at the Vulcan statue, way on the top of Iron Mountain, they had a one mile run. And yes. they would run straight down the mountain. It was like a thousand foot elevation change, and you'd, you'd end at Sloss Furnace. And it was the fastest mile I ever ran in my life. <laughs> because you're going straight downhill, you know, so, um, you know, where maybe the fastest I'd ever done before was a seven minute mile. This is a five minute and 15 second mile. And everybody was there to set their personal record. And that's where I got mine. So. <laughs> At least it wasn't uphill. <laughs> that's where I would draw the line. Mary, I, Mary, I was just going to say, when you come to Phoenix, we will go explore the, um, the, Desert Botanical Gardens. I walk there two days a week well, on my morning walk. Yeah, I haven't I seen the one in Phoenix, but I've seen the two in Tucson. Oh, and, yeah, yeah, the, the Desert Saguaro. Gardens. And, yeah, and the Saguaro. Yeah. But uh, come yeah. to Phoenix, and we'll we'll. Yeah, I know they're every, everybody's got their we'll garden, walk. and uh, I'm a real sucker for gardens. I just absolutely love them. So, yeah. Well, and, I'm so yeah, proud we did live in Birmingham for you know, the three or four years. Um, and I had not heard of the Aldridge Gardens mm -hmm. and I hadn't heard about the Arlington House. Uh -huh, I see. So These yeah. Are things you can visit on your own. Right. Uh, some of the things like tours of places, you're either with a group or possibly could um, arrange for a tour. There are a lot of visitor centers, like the Sloss has a visitor center. So there are things that you can do like that too. Right. But um, is there anybody else that has any comments or questions about it from the group? Um, it's, it's a comment, but that's just an addition. Um, we did a really interesting car trip, um, like following Black History. Um, mm -hmm. Selma walking over the... Yeah, we walked over the, the bridge. bridge. The, week, the, the week after Obama, the president walked across the Tess, bridge. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Lusa, I forget no, the name of the Pettis Bridge. Anyway, and then um, from there we went to Montgomery yeah. and then Birmingham. Yeah, all, all the civic rights museums this, in Montgomery. It was a amazing. fabulous trip and they're all very mm -hmm. near yeah. each other. So it's, a, it's an easy trip to plan. Um, there's another city that has an interesting uh, civil rights museum and that's Cincinnati. And I hope we get to do that sometime too. We, we actually ended in Cincinnati, but I didn't want to go um, farther. Because of them ferrying um, runaways across the river, that yeah. that got to be a kind of a gateway for, across from Kentucky into but, Ohio. So I there are a lot, of, a lot of things along, along the Ohio that, that are around. The one interactive exhibit, and I don't remember if it was that one or another one in that trip, the best one I ever thought was really frightening where you are a runaway slave and it's interactive and they give you these options like, you, you know, you go across the water and you hear a horse going by. Do you go across? Do you stay? Do you hide? And you have to make you have a to make choice instant instant decision. Decision. Yeah. To tell you whether you got caught or not, mm -hmm. whether you ate it. It was fascinating. Mm -hmm. And where was that? Uh, I just, it was, in, I'm not sure if it was the Montgomery Civil Rights Museum or, or another one that was we went one to of the in Birmingham. I don't, it was one of the two. Okay. Yeah. Um, I went, hello. Um, I wanted to, uh, Mary mentioned William Du Bois. 
And uh, I, we call him W-E-W-A here. Yeah. I live in Pittsfield and about 15 minutes from where I live is where he was born in oh. Great Barrington in Massachusetts. Oh. And he grew up there and graduated there from that area. And he was the first black man to attend Harvard. I don't know if anybody knew that. Oh, yes. So yes. When you brought that, his name up, I was like, oh my yeah. God. I had read that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, they just named a middle school in his honor okay. here locally. Now, the museum in Cincinnati is about the Civil War um, slave trade and the um, uh, Underground Railroad and, and that kind of thing. It's not the Civil Rights, it's Civil War Museum. Hmm. Not about the war itself, but, but the Underground Railroad part of it. But it's a very interesting place as well. Well, one other thing. Um, just so everybody knows if you want to plan your own trip to Alabama, we actually have six members in the Birmingham area. We have one in Tuscaloosa. Um, if, if you want to go see Bear Bryant and all the sports stuff, um, and I'm sure there are other things in Tuscaloosa. Um, but we have someone in Montgomery as well, which is the I state capital. We didn't say that. And um, no, then sure. we have somebody down along the coast, I believe, as well. And there's, you know, not very much of Alabama's on the coast. But um, anyway. I don't, I don't know how, how many are interested in golf, but the state of Alabama hired Frank Jones to, to make a series of specialized golf courses across the state and you have quite a few people that travel and will make that a, a trip where they play a different golf course in a different city each day and uh, travel diagonally across the entire state. Uh, Kathleen's uncle did that. Yeah. There was someone in Mobile because uh, I went to the Bellingrath Garden there and stayed with someone but that's been a couple of years ago. I don't know if they're still there or not. Well, and I think when we're done with COVID, we'll be having a bunch of people come back that, oh, you yeah. know. We're all ready to go somewhere, aren't we? <laughs> I just I want to remember, remind everybody of one of my, um, it was the place I, bucket list place. It's called the Unclaimed Baggage Center. Center. <laughs> And it's in Scottsboro, Alabama. And right along the northern border near Florence. So what, what it was, was um, a family had the luggage at some point on the bus. And, and then it, it turned out, well, what happens to all this baggage? And eventually they started uh, buying all the lost baggage from every airline in the United States. And- Well, look for your bag. Huh? Yeah, it's all, you have X amount of days to claim it. And then after that, it's sold in, in this uh, <coughs> raffle, not a raffle, uh, whatever. An auction. An auction. And so they buy it. They have the largest dry cleaning facility in the United States. So they clean all the clothes, but we could not believe what was there. There were departments for- It, it was like a giant Walmart. Yeah, used- oh, Everything. So everything from fur coats to wedding gowns to art to electronics to jewelry to ph pharmaceuticals to uh, linens and bedding and you wouldn't believe you know you know braces and canes and false teeth and, there, there were iPhones and iPads and, and, and iMacs and, 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 and anyway and it was it was fascinating um, we we did shop and uh, bought a few things and they were fabulous you could so, buy a wedding dress you could buy a mink coat. Anyway, so um, if you get there, then I definitely would do the side trip yeah. over to the unclaimed baggage uh, center. What town is that? Scottsboro. 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 And the reason it's there is that's because that's where the family lived. 